Can I invite you to take your Bibles, your smartphones, your iPads? If you'd lift them for me, hold up the word of the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to invite you to turn with me in the word of God to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I want to speak to us about overcoming hardships. You know, this is a particularly difficult season that men and women are are going through. You know, it seems like COVID is that lingering thing that has affected so many. It's affected so many lives, even the youngest among us. I just read this past Thursday in the Wall Street Journal that the death rate among children ages 10 to 19 is growing at an alarming rate. And that the number one cause of death among children within that age bracket is through drug use and suicide. Now, when you think about that, that's astonishing. It's grievous, but it also ought to make us indignant that our culture is creating such an environment that is so adversely affecting our children that many of them are seeking answers by taking their own lives or taking drugs. But this problem is not just germane to our children. It's plaguing our adults as well. Drug use, prescription drug use among adults are at an all-time high. Sleeping aids are at an all-time high. As people are having a difficult time sleeping at night because of the stress, the worry, the anxiety, and so on and so forth. It's a particularly stressful time for you. And I know that there are men and women right here in this sanctuary that are going through it. I know there are some of you at home who are going through it. And you are desperately looking for answers. You're desperately looking for that safe place. And the adversities of life are coming in and it's squeezing out the very peace of the Lord, the very joy of the Lord. But I want us to know, beloved, that God has not left us without an answer. God has not left us without a remedy. God has not left us without a promise. And that God's answer, God's remedy, and God's promises are available to us right here, right now, through the Word of Almighty God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to begin reading in the New International Version. Would you read along with me or listen and join with me? Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. We don't become discouraged to the point of quitting. That's what Paul is saying. We do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, And ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Verse 7. 
But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that His life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Shall we pray? Father, we declare this is your word. It is life, it is love, it is liberty, it is revelation, it is truth. And in it we are encountered by you, the living God. Therefore, we love you and we love your word. We ask that you'll give us clarity of mind, openness of heart, receptivity of spirit. You would allow your word to bring conviction, transformation, and empowerment to our lives so that we can be everything that you want us to be and do everything that you want us to do in Jesus Christ's mighty name. And the church of Jesus Christ said, Amen and Amen. Sir Edmund Hillary attempted to climb the highest mountain, Mount Everest, on several occasions, on many occasions, several of which he failed to summit. After one failed attempt, he stood at the base of that giant mountain, balled up his fist, and in defiance shouted these words, I will defeat you yet again. Because you're as big as you're going to get, but I'm still growing. With each failed attempt, Sir Edmund Hillary learned lessons. With every learned lesson, he grew, he became better, he became stronger, until the point in which Sir Edmund Hillary summited the highest mountain peak on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, can I suggest to you that what Edmund Hillary did in terms of overcoming obstacles in his life, we also ought to embrace that same commitment that the hardships of our lives, the difficulties of our lives will not cause us to cower but it will cause us to rise up in defiance against that which resists us. And that in the name of Jesus Christ, we overcome it for the glory of God Almighty. Can the church say, Amen? Amen. One of the characteristics of successful people is their ability to say, never am I going to quit, nor am I going to turn my back. I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to walk with endurance. I'm going to endure with patience. I'm going to apply diligence and determination and operate in the spirit of perseverance. And I'm going to stick to it until I overcome for the glory of Almighty God. Proverbs 24 and verse 16 says, The godly may trip seven times but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. Can I read that again? That would have been a grand time for you to say, yes, pastor, you may. (laughs) May I read it again? Beautiful. The godly may trip seven times, but they will get up again. But one disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. You know what separates righteous men and women from the wicked of this world? Both the righteous and the wicked will face obstacles. We will have to go through hardships and conflicts. 
but the righteous will not be bowed by it, that we will rise up in the authority of Jesus Christ and we will overcome, but the wicked give up, the wicked cower, the wicked retreat, and ladies and gentlemen, let the righteous of the living God never shrink back, but we will embrace the call of God upon our lives. Vince Lombardi, how many of you um, grew up in an era where you saw him coach? Would you lift your hand? That was not me, but Art, I see several among us that you saw Vince Lombardi coach. They say he's the greatest football coach ever. Vince Lombardi once said, press on, press on, because nothing can take the place of persistence. Here's the big idea. Here's, here's what I want us to camp on. Because peradventure, you're going through something today. You're dealing with stuff in your life. It's discouraging you. It's, it's causing you to lose your joy and lose your strength. I want you to take a hold of this. That the key to overcoming is learning to persevere in the seasons of adversity. In Jamaica, we have a saying, better must come. Those of my Jamaican brothers and sisters who come to Solid Rock know exactly what I mean. Better must come. That phrase, that saying, emerged in the 70s when Jamaica was going through serious political turmoil. It was transitioning against the overall will of the people from a democracy to a Cuban-style socialism, communism. My family got caught up in all of that. And in that transition towards socialism and communism, there was a lot of turmoil and violence and unrest that grew. Innocent people were thrown into jail. It was called gun court without due process. It began to affect a large segment of our society. There was economic travail and pressure as we moved away from a, a private-based capitalistic economy to a more socialized ca communistic uh, economy, and that private industry and private businesses were being commandeered and taken over by the government. It began to throw Jamaica into serious turmoil. It was in the midst of that that my father, who is a Canadian by birth, decided to move his family back to Canada, and in 1976, we returned to, to Canada. But out of all of that upheaval, Jamaicans who are always optimistic came up with the saying, better must come. I want to encourage you, wherever you are and whatever you're going through, better will come. Better will come as we learn to trust God, as we begin to, to embrace the challenges of our day, and lean upon the truths of Almighty God. So I want to ask a question this morning. And in your mind, I'd like for you to answer it. I want you, and you'll see it on the screen. Do you finish things that you start? I want you to answer always, usually, sometimes, or never. It's not on the screens. It should be on the screens. But nevertheless, I'm going to persevere and overcome. <laughs> so answer this in your mind. Do you finish things that you start? Always, usually, sometimes, or never? Circle it, mark it in your mind. What is your personality type? Are you given over to always persevering, usually, sometimes, or never? You see, the degree to which we answer that question will determine whether we'll become an overcomer in Christ or not. Let me share with us, beloved family, there is a tremendous cost in quitting. Giving up comes at an enormous price. I read the story of a boy who was trying to learn to ice skate. He had fallen so many times that his face was cut up. His body was bruised and sore. Blood was coming out 
of his nose, of his ears, and tears were flowing freely out of frustration from his eyes, out of sympathy. A man skated over to the boy, picked him up and said, Son, why don't you quit before you kill yourself? To which the little boy wiped the tears from his eyes, the snot from his nose, and said, I didn't buy these skates to learn how to quit. I bought them to learn how to skate. <laughs> Beloved, God didn't put you on planet Earth. He did not invest his image in you. He did not send his son to planet Earth to hang on a cross, to die on that cross, for you to give up on life. But he died on that cross. He rose up from the grave so that you can also rise up in resurrection power and to overcome every obstacle and every hardship in your life. This is why Jesus came to this earth. Resurrection power to save us from our sins and to empower us to live an abundant life in Jesus Christ. Can the church say amen? amen. Now I want to direct your attention to the passage of Scripture that I read in your hearing. This part of Corinthians is, is autobiographical. It's autobiographical in that Paul begins to write and give some insight into himself. And what he's writing in this portion of 2 Corinthians is, is an expression of what he has lived through. It's Paul in his vulnerability. Paul in his transparency, this mighty man of God, the most brilliant mind uh, in the New Testament other than obviously Jesus Christ, begins to reveal some things about himself. If you'll notice there, beloved, in that passage of Scripture, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, Paul says, we do not lose heart. He's speaking about himself. Though the circumstances are rough, though the suffering is great, though the persecution is intense, I will not allow myself to become, to become discouraged. I will not allow myself to give up on God and to give up upon myself. In the verses that follow, Paul uses four terms to describe circumstances that some of you might feel yourselves in right here, right now. The first term that he uses, he says, I'm hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. He's saying, I've got pressure coming from the north, the south, the east, and the west. He said, wherever I turn, there's pressure. Whatever I do, there's pressure. Whatever things that I say, there's pressure. My very life is filled with pressure. Some of you may be feeling the same way. Everywhere you turn, there's pressure. Whatever you try to do, there's pressure. No matter whether it's at home or on the job, whatever it is, there's pressure, pressure, pressure. You may be living there right now. The second, he says, is I'm perplexed, but not in despair. I don't know the pressure that's going on. I don't know the circumstances in your life. But what I do know, beloved family, is that this season of life is hard. It's coming at us at blistering pace. It's bringing into our lives an intensity of anguish and hardship. We're wondering, are we ever going to be able to rise above it, to keep our heads above the water? Uses an interesting word. That word perplexed. In the Greek, it, it means to be stretched beyond limit. You take an elastic band. The elastic band is designed to stretch. It's designed to be elongated. But there's a point in which it's stretched that it can stretch no further. And at the point it reaches that tension, it, it snaps. Some of you may be feeling that you're stretched beyond limit. You feel that you're about to snap emotionally. You feel that you're about to have a mental breakdown. 
You're at that place where life is perplexing. It's overwhelming. It's stretching you beyond your ability to cope. I want you to know that there's grace. There's a third term that Paul uses. He said, I'm persecuted. You know, when one begins to peel back the original, it, it means to be hounded, to be hunted, to the point in which one feels abandoned by everyone, including God. Some of you may feel that God is no longer listening to your prayers that he perhaps no longer even loves you, that he's turned his back on you. Beloved friend, I do not know the circumstances that are coming into your life, but you're feeling hounded. You're feeling hunted. You begin to feel overwhelmed, and you're wondering if God even cares for you. I want to tell you unequivocally that God cares, God listens, God loves, and he knows exactly what is going on in your life. There's a fourth term. He said, I'm struck down, but not destroyed. Paul uses the image of a, of a boxer, one who has been in a fight in the ring, and he's been struck, and he's been struck whether it's a body blow, whether it's an uppercut to the head, that those blows continually come fast and furiously to the point that it's wearing him down, that he feels that he's about to collapse, and there are times in which Paul did collapse, but he says, I am knocked down, but I am not destroyed. It means that no matter how many times you knock me, I'm going to get up again in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Paul's autobiographical information is telling us that Paul is a man of resilience. He knows how to persevere. He knows how to endure. He knows not to give in. So for those of you in this room, those of you watching, whatever the circumstances are, you may feel helpless. You may feel hopeless. Look, I'm trying to speak beyond the mind and into the heart. I'm trying to cut through the fog of your life. I'm trying to cut through all of the difficulties of your life to let you know that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. And no matter where you are, beloved family, God is with you. He's walking through every moment with you. So, as we walk through these few verses, what are some of the truths, some of the keys? What is it that we can apply to our lives that will help us to overcome? to remain faithful, to not give up, to somehow press in, to persevere, and to hold on until God lifts us out of that morass and that God sets our feet on the solid rock to say, number one, his beloved family, we're going to have to depend on God's mercy. If you'll notice in verse 1, Paul writes, since therefore through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. How many of you are losing heart? How many of you feel that the very vibrancy of life is just seeping out of you day by day? Each day that you get up is a struggle. Each day there's a little less strength. There's a little more, little less vitality, a little less intensity and motivation. Each day just squeezes a little bit more out of you. Would you circle that word mercy? Highlight it if you're using your Bible digitally. But I want you to camp on that word mercy for just a moment because God's mercy is God's ability that we do not have in and of ourselves. We could not save ourselves from our sin. Therefore, God sent His Son. That's mercy. But mercy just doesn't apply to the place of our own sinfulness. Ladies and gentlemen, when our own ability falls short, we do not have the strength to walk through the hardship. There is mercy that meets us in the place of our deficiency. God's mercy comes. That's why the scripture says, in our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. Whatever it is, lean on God's mercy. God knows what you're going through. God knows every single thing that you're going through. It's a matter of God's mercy, beloved. We cry out to Him. You see, we're able to overcome because God is committed to us. 
You know, there have been times I've shared family with our congregation, and, and I've shared it in part. I've shared it with, my, with our board in whole, in full. But just being with my family again in, in Canada, I had an opportunity to talk to, to someone, just reflecting upon the most difficult season that I had just prior to COVID and, and even just struggling whether I wanted to continue in ministry, honestly. Just the, the pressure of it and, and self-induced expectations, not from the leadership of this church, not from you, but just the self-induced expectations, the drivenness in my own life to want to accomplish more and to do more for the kingdom of God. It just brought about a huge sense of pressure in my own heart that really began to, to cause me to question the call of God upon my life and whether I wanted to remain in ministry or not. And all of the second guessing of myself and, and just wondering, has it come time for me just to step away from ministry? I look back at that time, beloved family, and I realize that it was the, it was the most difficult season in over 33 years of pastoring just a few years ago. 19, 7, 2017 and 18 leading into COVID and going through all of that. And I look back on that period of time and COVID came. And as a result of COVID, a ministry shut down all across the country and all across the world for, for the most part. And how that became a time for me to recalibrate my life. Dana knows I really thought about just throwing in the towel and walking away. It was God's grace, God's mercy that kept my hand on that plow. It was the encouragement of a leadership team here at this church that encouraged me and said to me, God is not finished with you yet at this church. Your season is still here. They held me steady, beloved family. That was an effusion of God's mercy. When I thought it was time for me to walk away, God's mercy anchored me to the call of God. He says, I'm not done with you yet. I want to tell you this morning, friend, God's not done with you yet. Hold on. God's mercy, God's mercy, God's mercy. Here's the reality of this when it comes to God's mercy. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. But because of God's great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. Can someone say amen? God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Let me tell you two things about God's mercy. Number one, beloved family, is that you and I do not need to prove our worth to God. We don't have to work ourselves up, froth ourselves up, somehow develop this lather about our lives that we're good enough to win and earn the favor of God. We can never earn the favor of God in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. We were far from God. He still loved us doesn't matter what you're going through. It does not matter where you're at, beloved family. You cannot work yourself into a righteous ladder hoping to gain the favor of God. He loves you because you're his child and he's placed his image on the inside of you. You may feel so filled with condemnation. I want you to know that God loves you and God's grace is flowing into your life. The second truth I want you to know about God's mercy is that we don't have to live under condemnation and guilt. Here's what the Word of the Lord says. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of those same testings we do. Yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace. And there we will receive his mercy. And that we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Beloved, you may be living under condemnation and guilt and shame. 
and that with every passing moment, that guilt and condemnation and shame just heaps up like a tsunami upon your soul, threatening to drive you down into the belly of the sea. But I want you to know that God's grace and God's mercy rushes in and He washes away our guilt and our condemnation. And He says, you are mine. You're accepted in the beloved. That's why this is good news. There's now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The second reality that comes flooding through is that we need to maintain a clear conscience. Look at verse 2. If we're going to overcome, we're going to have to maintain a clear conscience. Paul writes these words, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. To renounce something means that we, we repudiate it. We reject it. We reject its claim upon our lives. We reject its influence upon our lives. If there's patterns of lifestyles and behaviors and, and mind, mind thoughts that are, are flooding our minds that are contrary to the Word of God, that are, that are not pure in the sight of God, Paul says that we must renounce them. We repudiate them. We somehow shun its claim over our lives. It has no stronghold in our mind. He says we do not use deception nor do we distort the word of God. What is Paul saying? Paul says that he's, he's not going to manipulate. He's not going to deceive people. He's going to deliver the pure, unadulterated word of God. Because the word of God is powerful enough to set every person free. So he says, I'm not going to use deception. We're not going to distort. We're not going to manipulate but we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul says, I'm going to live transparently. I'm going to live humbly. I'm going to live humbly before God. I'm going to be an open book before God. The dark places of my life I'm going to expose to God. In Romans chapter 7, Paul, in a sense of unvarnished honesty and transparency before the Lord, he said, the things I hate to do, I do. The things that I want to do, I'm not doing. And he says, it grieves me. He said, the things that I long to do for the glory of God are the things that I'm not doing and the things that I, I hate to do, I am doing. What is it? He says, it's the war that's going on inside of him. The desires of the flesh working against the desires of the spirit and on the inside, there is an eruption. There is a volcano of activity and conflict in his life. And he says, oh, who will deliver me from this body of death. You know what's fascinating about that? There's a context to that. Because you see, the, the Roman practice was that in a time that if you killed a man, if you were found guilty of, a mur of murdering someone, that you would have to actually carry that dead body on you. And that you would walk around in that community, everybody would know that you're a murderer. So when Paul writes these words, who will deliver me from this body of death? He's saying that it's this conflict that's going on the inside of him. The things that he does that he does not want to do. It's like a dead body stinking. It's hanging on. It's weighing him down. Paul is saying, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he goes on in Romans 8 to say that Jesus Christ, by the power of the Spirit of God, is able to free him from this body of death. I say to you today, beloved friend, would you come clean with God? Would you open up? Be honest with him. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're feeling. He knows all the struggles. The best thing is just to come clean with him and say, God, here I am. This is what I'm dealing with. This is what's going on inside. I truly want to be an overcomer, but God, I've got to come clear. I have to open up my heart, my life to you. See my ways. See all of my wicked ways. Would you forgive me? He will do that, beloved family. You see, guilt has a way of sapping our strength. Guilt has a way of sealing our joy. And if we have no joy, we have no strength. That's what the Bible says. The joy of the Lord is our strength. 
So when we discover, beloved, that God knows what we're going through, and if we'll just open up our hearts in humility and transparency before Him and say, God, this thing is set up in my mind. It's set up in my spirit. I know it's not pleasing to you, but God, I renounce it. I repudiate it. I reject its influence over my life. It can no longer hold me in bondage in Jesus' name as we open up our hearts to Him. God does a beautiful thing, and He begins to clear our conscience. He begins to purify our minds. And thirdly, beloved family, if we're going to overcome the hardships in our life, Paul tells us in his autobiographical information, he said we need to ensure the right motivation. Why we do what we do, it's important. Here's what the Word of the Lord says in verse 5. Paul says, for we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord. And ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul had his life mission right. He had his life priorities in right order. His motivation, his, his, his desires to do what he was doing was not for self-gratification, for ego fulfillment. He was preaching Jesus Christ and not himself. Everything that Jesus did, uh, that Paul did, was for the glory of God Almighty. Can I ask you, beloved family, would you search your own heart right here, right now? Why do you do the things that you do? Sometimes the hardships of our lives are because we're doing it out of wrong motivation. We have wrong priorities. There's a misalignment in our lives. And so when we try to do it for our own satisfaction, our own fulfillment, our own ego gratification, beloved family, we set ourselves up contrary to the will of God. And it wears us down and it wears us out. If we want to overcome the hardships of our lives, we've got to examine our motivation and say, God, would you help me to have a pure heart and to do this out to the right spirit. You see, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Think about this for a moment. Is Jesus a truth teller? Yes. So when Jesus tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, he's telling us that I've designed life for us in such a way, for the people of God in such a way, that it should not be burdensome. If there are things that we're doing in our lives that are burdensome, that are draining us, that are robbing us of our peace and our joy, then beloved family, we're doing something wrong. Because Jesus explicitly and expressly tells us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If life has become burdensome, if life has, be if life has become so overwhelming, it's because we're doing life not in God's way. We're trying to do life in our own way and resultantly it's wearing us down. So sometimes the best thing that we ought to do is just press the pause button. I have to do that quite often when I'm watching TV. And the reason is because um, Queen Dana comes into the room. <laughs> when Queen Dana comes into the room, 35 years of marriage has taught me that uh, Servant Jay ought to stop and listen to what Queen Dana has to say. Something's not fair in this house. That would have been a grand opportunity for you to support your pastor. You know that. <laughs> and if I'm hoping that I will ignore Dana, she will just pass through that room and I can go on my merry way. But not Queen Dana. If Queen Dana comes into the room and I haven't paused the TV, all she does is just lift her left hand and she waves it this way. And what she is saying is, you better pause that TV or you ain't getting dinner tonight. Sometimes the best thing for us to do is to press the pause button. When life seems to be racing on, and it seems to be carrying us further and further into the rip currents of life, and it's pulling us in such a way that we feel helpless and hopeless, and we're just drifting off into nowhere. Sometimes we just need to press the pause button and be silent before God and ask God, would you expose the motivations of my heart? Beloved family, we need to examine ourselves. Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. 
And he was right. And sometimes we need to say, God, would you search my heart? King David did. He said, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. Beloved family, I'm not advocating that we, we search our heart because of, of some gross sin and, and that is the only reason we search our hearts. We want to search our heart if there's gross sin. Absolutely we do. But searching our heart just asks us and invite God to come into the deepest recesses of who we are and we invite Him to expose wrong motives, improper attitudes, misaligned priorities. Think about it, beloved. When things begin to unravel in our lives, it's many times because our motives are not right and we have misaligned priorities. They're not kingdom priorities. And because of that, we begin to become frustrated, we begin to become exasperated, and we lose our will, we lose our motivation. So sometimes slow down, listen, and let God speak into our hearts. And as King David discovered, see if there's been any wicked way in me. And then it says, and let your Holy Spirit restore unto me a clean heart and a pure spirit so that I might have the joy of the Lord again. Finally, Nana, would you come and team? Finally. If we want to overcome hardships in our lives, beloved, we need to accept our limitations. In verse 7, Paul writes these words. He says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to showcase or to show off the all-surpassing power is from God and not ourselves. I want us to realize that every single one of us in this room have our limitations. As extraordinarily talented, as brilliant as all of you are, as enormously powerful you are in the Spirit, every single one of us have our limitations. I know we're one week removed from Mother's Day. And moms, your heart is to want to solve everybody's problems. That's the nurturing nature of God in you. To look after your loved ones, your family, and you do it at your own personal expense. You want to make sure that your husband is taken care of. You want to make sure your children are taken care of. And you do and you go until there is no more strength in you. Until you've lost yourself and you wonder why. Take time. Recognize your own limitations. Recognize that there's only so much of us that can go around. And there's only so much that we can give. Because the moment, beloved family, that we lose the boundaries of our capacities and the boundaries of our competences and the boundaries of our strength, that is when we burn out. And that's when we grow exhausted, exasperated. And we want to give up. We want to give in. Know our limitations. Paul, the mighty man of God, understood he said God had given him the ministry to preach the gospel to the Gentile world. What this means, beloved family, is that God had commissioned Paul to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the pagan world, which was by far the, the, the vast majority of the world. He says, I am putting it on your shoulders, Paul. And Paul took that mission seriously. But Paul in verse 7 says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What is the treasure? The treasure is the Holy Spirit. What's the earthen vessel? Our bodies. The very mechanism that we live out this life. The very vehicle that we use to do what God's called us to do. To serve our families. To serve the world that is around us. Paul says that there is a great disconnect between what God has called him to do. To preach the gospel to the Gentile world. And the limitations of this earthen vessel. But he said that that disconnect. That huge vacuum. That huge gap between the mission and Paul's physical capacity. Is only going to be fulfilled by the power of the Holy Spirit 
that God's Spirit is on the inside of the Apostle Paul and that when Paul learns to lean on the strength of the Holy Spirit, that is when he will fulfill his mission. It is no different than every single one of us in this room, beloved family. God's given us a purpose and sometimes the responsibilities of our lives are far greater than our capacity to handle it in our own physical strength. So what do we have to do? We invite Holy Spirit to come in and Holy Spirit to live out of us and through us so that we can accomplish. The Bible says, not by might, not by power, but by my Holy Spirit, says the Lord. This coming Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. We're going to celebrate Holy Spirit here in the house. I want you to be here. We're going to celebrate Holy Spirit. I want to bring a word to this congregation. I pray we'll, we'll speak into our hearts and our lives. But beloved family, we have to allow the infusion of Holy Spirit to come in and to live through us because the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same Spirit that lives and operates on the inside of every single one of us. It's allowing Him. It's allowing Him. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I don't want to pretend to know where you're at, what you're going through. But what I am unashamedly convicted and convinced of is that whatever you are going through is well able to be handled by the Holy Spirit working in you and through you. So precious Father, in this moment of personal transparency and humility. I ask, oh God, that even now the pressure that's on the inside of your people will begin to abate. They begin to retreat. God's yoke is easy. His burden is light, beloved. In a moment, I'm going to invite our ministry team to come. These men and women of God are men and women of God filled with faith. They're operating in the authority of the Spirit of God. We're going to do what the Bible says to call for the elders of the church to lay hands upon you and to pray. Friend, I do not care what it is that you are walking through that we are going to stand with you. We're going to pray with you. We're going to bear the burdens of, of, the, of your life with you and so fulfill the law of Jesus that you're not going to have to bear those burdens alone. Minister team, would you come? Those of you that are remaining seated, maybe this morning, your very first step is the step to ask Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. Therefore, nothing happens apart from our humbling ourselves before God and recognizing that we're sinners. Recognizing that sin has set up a stronghold in our lives and that we cannot break that stronghold up of ourselves. Only Jesus Christ, through His death and His resurrection and the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit that can free you from that. That's the only way. It's the Jesus way. So this morning, friend, if you want to be freed from your sin, if you want the forgiving presence of Jesus to flow through your life, would you lift your hand in the house and say, that's me. I, want, I need to be honest. Just say, I need to be honest with you, Pastor. I need Jesus to forgive me of my sin. I want to become a child of God. Would you lift your hand? Let God's presence, let God's mercy, let God's grace wash over your heart and your life. God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else in the house? Today you're here and God's just pulling you. He's inviting you. He's convicting you. And you're saying, Lord, I surrender to you. Just lift your hand, friend. Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else? Just lift your hand. You're not alone. You're among family. All of us have come to that place of surrender or the vast majority of us. Those of you online, I extend that invitation to you. You've heard God's word. You're feeling God's presence. Would you pray this prayer with us? 
all over this room, in your room there online. Join with us. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Today I am convinced. Today I am convinced that I have sinned. That I have sinned. I have fallen short of your glory. I have fallen short of your glory. And I repent of my sin. And I repent of my sin. I have done wrong. I have done wrong. I renounce it. I renounce it. I reject its influence upon my life. I reject its influence upon my life. And I ask you to cleanse me. And I ask you to cleanse me. Wash away the sins. Wash away the sins. From my heart. From my heart. From my conscience. From my conscience. And from my soul. And from my soul. And today by faith. And today by faith. I receive the gift of salvation. I receive the gift of salvation. I trust Jesus as my Savior. I trust Jesus as my Savior. And I ask you to be my Lord. And I ask you to be my Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you prayed that prayer, would you allow the Spirit's work just to begin to seep down deep into your soul? The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You're in the process right now of Jesus cleansing your heart. So my Father, do this work. The guilt, the condemnation, the shame, obliterate it. Let them begin to feel peace. Let them begin to feel in right standing with you. It's over with, friend. Renounce it. Repudiate that that sin. Reject it. Say, no more it has claim on my life. No more does it have claim over my soul. But thank you for the life-giving spirit that comes. If you prayed that prayer, beloved, there's a card there in the seat back in front of you. There's a table over there to my left. Pastor Bronwyn is walking over there right now. At the end of this service, would you take that card? Would you go to her? Would you share that you prayed that prayer with the pastor? Would you do that? Because we want to come along and help you and encourage in your faith so that you're not alone. Those of you online, would you email us? Let us know that you prayed that prayer today. And Pastor Bronwyn, myself, we'll reach out to you and encourage you in your journey. But those of you in this congregation, that life has gotten to the point where it seems overwhelming. It's draining. It's too demanding. Would you stand all over this room with me? All over this room, would you stand? Everyone. In a moment, I'm going to invite those of you that want somebody to pray with you, to bear this burden with you, to pray the prayer of faith. Would you come? Friend, there's no reason to go through what you're going through in a solo fashion because we're called to be a part of a family we're called to bear one another's burdens I wonder as I look across our fellowship today how many of you are dealing with stuff that just seems day by day grows it's becoming more overwhelming would you lift your hand you're there you're saying this is where I'm at I'm going through some stuff right now and I just need somebody to bear this burden with you Jesus said his yoke is easy his burden is light. Our team sings. Would you step out? Would you come? We'll pray with you and pray for you. Thank you. I invite you to come. Those of you that are watching online, God has designed you to be a part of a family. He's designed you to be a part of a church. And we want to help you. Life was never constructed by God for you to live in isolation but to be a part of a community that will love you for who you are and help you. Solid Rock is such a church. We invite you to join with us. Let's worship Him, beloved, as we lift our hearts, as we lift our hands. Praise to God.